I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, Ambassador, but you, I, I wonder whether Professor Jones's uh, position is more intellectually defensible or intellectually true to what happened. You said that there was law that applied. Can you describe to us here what law protected the prisoner, prisoners at Guantanamo when they first arrived there? What body of law were they protected by? Well, I, th I think, uh, you know, we're, we'll get into a little more, I guess, uh, detail or complexities, and I need to resurrect my memory, but I think the position that the administration took was that it wasn't that the, the Geneva Conventions in its entirety did not apply. It, it, in, in a sense, they, the, the president chose to apply aspects of it, and, and what he would say is, or what they did say, is that there'd be basic humane uh, treatment that was required. Now, whether in some people's view it was followed is a, is a different story, but the, the, the view was that there were aspects of the convention that would apply. Uh, Gabor, did you want to respond to that or, or go uh, to Professor yeah, Jones? Just a, uh, it's, yeah, I think it's more than a technicality, but, but it, I think it is technically correct. If you look at the President's memorandum of February 7, 2002, you will note that um, he takes the position that, according to advice, he has the power to suspend Geneva, but he chooses not to at the time. So yes, technically, conventions apply. The memo goes on to say, however, that neither Taliban nor Al-Qaeda detainees, and according to the administration, that is the universe of, of um, the detained population, um, are, are none of them are entitled to either prisoner of war status or to the protections of common Article 3. And in particular, and I think what is the most distressing aspect of the President's determination, is the conclusion that um, none of these individuals are legally entitled to humane treatment. Then it goes on to say, however, as a matter of policy, because of who we are, we will treat them humanely, subject to military necessity, which I think was mentioned yesterday is a concept that has no place in detention operations. So I, I think it is important that um, the, the Commander-in-Chief um, has put the word out to all concerned that the individuals um, that he is speaking of are in fact in his view beyond any law, beyond any law that protects individuals um, in terms of, uh, of any requirement of humane treatment and that frankly is shocking. And so Professor Jones, let me come back to you and, and, and in light of what the ambassador and, and Mr. Rohn have just said, uh, be a little bit more forceful with you then. What you described is the idea of um, the difficulty of restraining conduct literally on the battlefield, uh, boots on the ground, fast-moving situation, uh, fraught with peril for, for our soldiers. Uh, is that a fair statement uh, when we're talking about the application of common Article 3 to prisoners who are substantially removed in space and time uh, uh, from the battlefield, interrogations of, for instance, uh, as um, uh, Professor Sands talked about yesterday, uh, of Muhammad al Qatani, months and months later that went on for 54 days uh, after he had already been observed uh, psychotic by the FBI. Uh, and if that's not consistent with Common Article 3, and it flows from the President's determination that Common Article 3 is not obligatory but merely uh, a matter of policy, isn't it appropriate for the judiciary to step in as they did in the Hamdan decision? Well, there's, there's two things there. Uh, one, I, I do take the position that there were, there were clear violations of the law. I do not believe that there is a gap uh, in the Geneva Conventions. I think that everybody who was detained either falls under the prison of war or the civilian convention. And so I don't subscribe to the theory that there is a gap, and I think that it is accurate if we are talking about the strict letter of the law that common Article 3 applies uh, as a basic protection uh, for everyone. So if we were to say that, uh, uh, if we were to accept the proposition that common Article 3 at least applies and that there is no gap and that uh, either they fall under the civilian convention or the prison of war convention, then clearly what took place with many of the prisoners uh, was a violation of the letter of the law. 
I think that that's the point that I am making, that the letter of the law is not controlling conduct. I think that you made the point that policy really is driving the law. I would say that policy really is acting as the authority on the battlefield rather than the law itself. Am I answering the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Ambassador, let me turn the question to you then. In light of um, uh, Professor Jones' proposition that you know, the law exists, although it may be violated in practice, uh, Mr. Rohner's proposition that uh, you have to do more than simply declare the policy of the United States to be compliance with Common Article 3 because it uh, creates the intolerable risk, a risk which, a risk which came to pass, of abuses. Um, uh, the administration doesn't show any inclination to be self-correcting. Doesn't that lead you to the conclusion that the courts have to play a role? Why did the administration oppose Hamda? Well, I mean, I, th I think the courts do have a, a role to play, and they're 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 playing a role. It will all be sorted out with time. But, but again, I mean, some of the constitutional uh, challenges remain, and and it's it's basically some of the things that you raised regarding. You know, where does the power lie? Is it with the uh, the commander in chief? Is it with the courts, or is it with the Congress? I think one one of the things that's really challenging here is we're we're looking at the court's role in this arena, and it's really focused on all, uh, you know, particularly on, on on Guantanamo. All the cases are coming up and coming out of Guantanamo, but but the, the it begs the question of what is the reach of the court? I mean, putting aside the constitutional issues of whether they can actually engage in areas that are believed to be within the responsibility of the Commander-in-Chief. First, the first question that the Supreme Court had to decide, well, was it appropriate to have jurisdiction over Guantanamo? And the Supreme Court decided, well, Guantanamo is, is different because it's quasi-United States, but it's still extraterritorial. Now the next question is, once you begin to look at these issues, assuming you, you, you uh, reconcile the issue of, of the balance of power, does the reach now extend even beyond that in time of war? Now can we deal with situations and start talking about uh, the you know, detainees or other issues in Iraq and Afghanistan in other parts of the world? So, I, so while we say that there's a role to play, I think it's the question of what is that role and the reach of that role still remains.